Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist podcast. Uh, I'm very happy to have with us today Christos Makervis. Um, he's based in the US. Uh, he's a researcher in the area of economics. Uh, he's the CEO of his own company in the area of token economics uh, called Dynamic. And he's also a researcher and professor at the University of Nicosia. Uh, Christos, um, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Delios. It's awesome to be here. Uh, would you like to share a few words about uh, who you are, what you do, and some of your current research, especially around gener generative AI? I know you've been studying some very interesting patterns, and I'm sure our audience is going to find them very, very useful. Yeah, well, um, first of all, I'm really glad that we uh, crossed paths back when um, I, I started working in University of Nicosia, and we kind of crossed orbits there. Um, University of Nicosia is just such an incredible place. It's it's kind of like the leading Web3 uh, institution, the first to have this kind of blockchain and economics of blockchain master's program. So it's just been a blast meeting people from all across the world and not being confined just to your own geographic footprint. But um, yeah, so I, I grew up in the United States. And my background is in economics and engineering. I did dual doctorates at Stanford in that area. And I, I developed a research agenda largely around how does technology and societal and economic forces, how do they change the way that the way that we work and the way that we live? And so you think about big changes like the adoption of computers, the introduction of the internet, the expansion of automation. And now we're seeing the introduction of generative AI. Uh, it's 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 really important to understand how that affects the way that we do our tasks, the way that we spend our time, the way that we communicate. One interesting result before we jump into kind of the, the issues at hand is a, a paper that I just released um, this past week and was working on more this weekend that was looking at time use patterns from the American Time Use Survey and how that's evolved over the past four years. And one of the big results, and maybe, maybe I don't know, some people might think it's kind of intuitive, but I think some people kind of know this is probably true, is that in the jobs that have uh, more remote work, uh, in the occupations where there's more remote work, uh, individuals in those occupations had about 50 minutes less uh, per day of work activities in 2022, relative to 2019. And then there was about a 40 minute per day increase in leisure activities. So there's been this massive change in how people are allocating their time. And it begs the question, what are they spending their time on? Some of it might be leisure, but actually a lot of it is going towards um, as well uh, an other category, which American Time Use Survey classifies as other, not otherwise classified. And so I think it's absolutely important for uh, researchers, for practitioners to come together and understand how technology is changing the, the very way that we spend our days and how we work. Uh, because it has productivity as well as well-being implications. And so I'm excited to dive into a little bit more of that today. Yeah. So in, in, with regards to generative AI, what are some of the first findings you have in that area? Um, obviously, generative AI has been around for quite a while, but I think its mass adoption started only about six months ago with a new version of yeah. um, GPT, uh, yeah, the GPT network now, the service called called GPT, I guess everyone knows it. So what are some of the findings that uh, in, in that area i know you've done some some research like how is generative ai yeah. being used how is it affecting our work lives our work life balance etc well one one paper that i have studies the question of coordination so how do people work in teams and coordinate over complex tasks and one of the reasons why you see a lot of high value jobs uh, geared towards smaller teams is because of the transaction costs associated with explaining uh, tacit information, that it just takes more time to be able to take what's in my mind, convey it to somebody else. And so it becomes easier just to work by yourself or work in smaller teams for very complicated tasks. This is one area where generative AI might be able to change the landscape a lot because now uh, you can take a complex task and partition it into different segments and sweep, sequence the workflow in a way that somebody might be able to pick it up a little bit more easily. And so in this paper, uh, we introduce a measure of coordination 
origination intensity that's coming from the Department of Labor's ONET database, where they basically ask different people and occupations about the tasks that they're doing, and, and, and we create a measure of coordination. And then we gather data as well from uh, the OpenAI paper that came out um, about three months ago, if I recall right. Um, uh, I think another Greek was the, the first author on it, Elon Liu. And, um, and what they introduced is a measure of exposure to large language models at an occupational level. So in other words, how much is a given occupation at risk, or I mean, you could call it an opportunity, you could call it a risk, but how exposed are they to large language models? So we take that data and then we correlate it with our uh, coordination intensity index. And we find a very, I think, optimistic result that the occupations that rank higher in coordination intensity are less exposed to large language models. And so this is a story, maybe not of pure complementarity, but certainly not of substitutability. In other words, the, the jobs that maybe um, are at most risk of being displaced by chat GPT are not the same jobs that require high degrees of coordination. And then we show that this is robust to controlling for demographic characteristics, education, age, et cetera. So it's not just some spurious correlation that's coming out. So more work is certainly required, but I think one of the big takeaways is that uh, this is going to have, of course, heterogeneous effects on the labor market, but um, what I can definitively or, or more definitively say is, is that it's going to uh, benefit a lot of uh, more skilled, uh, more complex work, and that should move our labor market into higher value tasks instead of, I mean, you just see a bunch of content marketers out there that are putting together absolute garbage, and it's you just don't want to see that in your inbox. So it will displace some of those lower value tasks, um, and then it will hopefully create greater incentives for the higher value tasks. Yeah, I, I think I was talking about um, this very topic with uh, someone who works in sales a couple of weeks ago, and he told me that he believes that many jobs in sales are going to be displaced and there's going to be some kind of full stack uh, sales manager. Uh, and maybe we'll see this in marketing, maybe in other areas. Uh, what do you think about coding? Do you think we might see something similar in, in software development? Yeah, well, a great question. I have two thoughts on this. One is, one is about the relational aspect of a lot of the work that we do. And then second is just over the tools that we have available for, uh, I'd say, kind of automating some of the, the programming um, skills that we rely on today. So um, I've been using Code Interpreter a lot. I was actually trying to use it to process some data this, this weekend. And uh, long story short, it didn't really do what I was uh, asking it to do. It just kind of kept running into problems. And now some of those technological problems will probably be overcome uh, as it relates to the size of the data set that I was feeding it, the complexity of the tasks that I was giving it. Um, and then I, but I did ask it to simplify. I asked it, well, take a random, if this data set is too big, take a random sample work with a smaller sample. It still wasn't able to do that. And so um, right now I'm kind of zero for two in terms of getting value from Code Interpreter. So I, I think if that's any indication, uh, there is going to be value behind people uh, that know how to do so, a craft, whatever that craft is, whether it's coding, whether it's something else, uh, really well. Um, because there will always, I believe, and maybe this is an opinion, but I, always, I believe that there's inherent creativity within us and that that creativity will always be a step ahead of uh, AI. The second aspect that I want to emphasize is the relational aspect to what we do. We aren't um, like we are having a conversation here because conversations are valuable. Social relationships are valuable. We didn't just get a subscription to HeyGen and then get a subscription to Zapier and Notion and put down our thoughts in five minutes and then automate a fake conversation. In theory, we could have done that, but we choose to have a relational aspect. And one thing that I see in banking, where I spend um, a lot of time in, in my company, Company dynamic is that there is a great preference for still doing certain activities with that relational aspect. You want to trust the bank that you bank with. You don't want to just get some recommendation from the internet, put all your money in there, and then just trust that it's going to be okay. You want to look into the eyes of the, of the representative of the bank that you're banking with. And so I still think that there will be a relational aspect to what we do. 
And in the, even in the area of programming, it might it, the, the relational aspect might be you want to trust the programmer and the instructions that are going into your scalable AI model, your scalable AI system, and know that there's the proper ingredients putting in. You're not just putting in a bunch of saturated fats into this automated system. So those, those are, I think, two reflections that I have about th this area. Interesting. And uh, I think uh, that you've also been doing some work in, in tokenomics, and I want us to briefly touch upon that. Um, can you describe, in your opinion, what's the current state of tokenomics these days? How do you think it's compared uh, versus you know 2017 from five, six years ago? I'm pretty curious to see, and I've been asking different experts, um, uh, what do they? What do? What do you think we're gonna see in the next bull run? Okay, so what yeah, well, tokenomic innovation? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, just to preface it, I obviously I appreciate greatly what you're doing there and the the move towards putting some of these models and machinery uh, more open source. And I think that's that's absolutely fantastic because this area needs a lot more structure. It's it's a huge wild west right now where people can uh, download data from CoinGecko, run some reduced form regression, and then and then think that you kind of discover gold. And I mean, I guess in a world where there's we don't know anything and it's just kind of like pitch black out there and you you find a piece of light um it, it, it maybe it is gold but what you want to make sure is that you're not picking up a, a snake so this is where i think uh, there's been a lot of um kind of unstructured work in this space and we need more theory to help us think about what we're finding so to talk more specifically about this i think that there's been um a forgetfulness of of the basic fundamentals you see this proliferation of tokens Tokens, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens that are out there. And it begs the question, what is the value proposition for that token? Uh, and that goes, again, back to very simple business. Why do you need that token out? What, what do consumers get by having this token out there versus what, what is already out there? And so simply coming to the market saying, hey, we're launching a new token. We have this very fancy monetary system for governing the demand and supply and for burning tokens. All that is second order. The first order question is, what are you achieving that hasn't been achieved today from all the other tokens that are out there. And, and, and honestly, it's very hard to find an intelligent response to a lot of those questions. I get why there's like a Ripple XRP token out there. Um, it's a utility token, or I mean, I guess this is debated, I suppose, but um, you think about, I think about it as this is kind of like your ticket to doing these cross-border transactions. I get that there's real world value there, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of other instances where there's not real world value. It's just it, it's just speculation. And I think that gives fodder to critics of crypto, legitimate fodder, to say, hey, this is malicious activity. This is fraudulent activity. This is speculative activity. We need to return to where the mm -hmm. actual value is being created and have a simple one sentence explanation. We launched this token because and then fill in the blank. Okay, okay, I see. And uh, do you think there are any synergies uh, between generative AI and tokenomics? Uh, I've seen some people in the community discussing about this. What's your opinion on that subject? Yeah, well, I think that um, these two areas are, are, are two sides of the same coin. I think of AI as the management and the analysis of large scale data. And I think about uh, DLT, uh, kind of the crypto web three world as a um, uh, a consensus mechanism, or I should say the cryptographic uh, consensus building um, to draw people together. And so when you have AI systems, you need to ensure that they're privacy compliant, secure, and so on. And, and so the short answer is I think that they'll be deeply complementary. Um, I, I'm, I'm always a little bit cautious and skeptical when I see um, all these like plugins and apps being created and they just say hey just give us your information um we'll we'll, we'll connect us to your google account and and I'm, i just uh think to myself uh how do i know that they're going to manage the data securely um how do i know that if if it's going to be accessing my emails or accessing other personal information that this is going that i trust it it's one thing to kind of trust like okay google is there i have a gmail uh, but then to open yourself up to all these other vectors opens up a lot more potential vulnerabilities. So I think distributed ledger technologies are going to be absolutely integral to having not only the security, but also the confidence that there is security and not exposing an entire network to cyber attack. But that if there is a point of failure, it's on an individual node instead of the whole system. So um, I, I think that they'll be deeply complementary.
Yeah, yeah. I think um, that uh, generative AI, something else that I guess that's relevant more for people working in the area of token economics, is that it might facilitate uh, the creation of simulations, uh, maybe some tools like Code Interpreter. I have some thoughts on that. You know, I've been developed my own simulations library. Now I've open sourced it called Talk Token Lab. At some point, when I get the time, I want to uh, essentially combine uh, ChatGPT or some other LLM and teach it how to create simulations. Uh, <laughs> but there's still, yeah. you know, quite lots of work to do also on the research side. Um, but uh, I do believe this might uh, facilitate. That'd be incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, you still need to know what you're doing, right? Uh, I don't yeah. think that uh, any random founder will just be able to run simulations. And I think it goes back to what you, you mentioned earlier, that with generative AI, you see certain complementarities. So I do think there's some kind of threshold and say, hey, above that becomes a productivity tool. Below that, it becomes, um, you know, replacement for your job, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's a really good way of saying it. And, and it, it kind of highlights how the right prompts, the right custom instructions, the right framework is necessary to get the most out of um, the, these tools. And so if all you do is kind of come in saying, hey, can you write me a 500 word story about X? It will give you a 500 word story. It just won't be very good. And that will replace the kind of low value content marketers, but it's not going to replace the people that understand how to tell stories that do um, good investigative work, whatever it might be. So I think, I think you hit it spot on. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think we covered quite a few topics uh, on that podcast. I know you have to go soon, so maybe we can finish like five minutes earlier. Uh, where yeah. can our listeners um, learn more about you, like personal website, company website, LinkedIn, uh, or yeah. the best place? Yeah, well, uh, so a lot of my research, uh, my academic research and writing in the press is just on my website, christosmacridis.com. Uh, and then what we're doing in dynamic is on uh, dynamic.ai, but it's spelled D-A-I-N-A-M-I-C.ai. And the idea is that there is a, a large class of mathematical applied math techniques called dynamic programming, which are, are very well suited for forecasting and for solving problems where there's dynamics and stochasticity uncertainty. And so the idea behind dynamic was use AI to democratize democratize access to these sophisticated techniques so that small and mid-sized businesses can get the same sort of access that a Google or an Amazon have to these really sophisticated models and now use it to make better decisions to forecast and understand what's happening to the economy. So um, what you'll see in Dynamic is a big focus on banking and financial technology. What you'll see more generally on, on my academic work as a scholar is around how technology and economic policy, society is changing um, and interacts with human flourishing. So uh, those, those are two things about uh, me. Uh, obviously, I have my LinkedIn and uh, and, and do some other work in, in the area of the fine arts, but uh, that, that's for another day. So yeah, really, really grateful to share this time with you, Stelios, and uh, excited to keep tracking on, on your work and for us to, to do some work together. Yeah, yeah. likewise, Christos. It's been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you, Stelios. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for staying here with us and make sure to visit the datascientist.com for more content on AI and Web3. Thank you.